Tylea's Troubles, Part 78. Unholy of Unholies. Second prequel to the Battle of the Valley of Death. Trantio City, early autumn, 2403. Moved by the malice coursing through his every vein, Biagino strode boldly through the great temple towards the sanctuary. Although the congregation's whimpering could be heard throughout the building, he failed to recognise it. For him, the sound was buried beneath the much more powerful sensation of their fear and the delicious stench of so much warm blood. As he greedily guzzled great gulps of the despair emanating from every living soul gathered within, their pathetic sobbing was akin to the subtle notes possessed by a fine wine on the edges of his perception. Besides, he had other distractions on his mind, not least the fact that an enormous army was camped to the west, clearly intent upon assaulting the city. Since late afternoon, he had been mulling over what to do about the enemy. Should he meet them upon the walls of Trantio, forcing them to assault the city? Or outside, where he could bring his whole force to bear? Should he even be attempting to take on such a massive foe at all? Perhaps his mistress would prefer he retreat than risk losing the army he now commanded. He had left Fiadaza with his own church of Nagash, including his vampire thralls and the huge mob of resurrected cultists he titled the Disciplinati di Nagash, but referred to as his children, and a small but powerful army gifted to him by the Duchess Maria, containing mighty, arcane constructs and even a monstrous undead dragon. Once he arrived at Trantio, this army had grown even stronger, as he, his step-get, Captain Tusco, and the necromancer, Pascal de la Cava, raised regiments of ancient warriors, both foot soldiers and horse, from the tombs, graves and burial pits of the necropolis valley of Noroccia. Yet the enemy army, no doubt a grand alliance of several many states, made all this seem paltry in comparison, which meant his next move was not to be an easy decision. He mounted the sanctuary and strode to the altar. Once ensconced behind it, he gave vent to an involuntary hiss and slammed his gold-topped crozier upon the stone floor, the sharp sound of which elicited a temporary cessation of the whimpers. His red-robed acolytes, the vampire thralls known as La Fraternita di Morti Iroquieti, stood nearby on the sanctuary, while his newly raised, fleshless soldiers lined every wall of the church. He paid them no attention, for they gave him nothing, only took from him. It was his will that lent them purpose. Without him, they would neither be nor do. Instead, it was the wretched huddle of people in the nave who fascinated him, for they he could feed on, play with and draw delight from their dread. Tonight, however, he wanted something different. He wanted their worship. Raising his hands to command their general attention, he began. Let us pray. There was some confusion amongst the gathered, and even that gave him joy. The living were a veritable cornucopia of feelings, every one improved by a seasoning of despair. He leered at them, then raised his eyes to the great temple ceiling, and began intoning. Nagashi, exauda nos, domine magistatis infinite, domine fornax ardens, domine virtutum omnium abisse, Domine omni laude dignissime. He fell silent and lowered his head to glare at the cowering flock before him. Well, he demanded. Someone began to sob, a child by the sound of it. No, he hissed angrily. Say the words. The nearest acolyte, his face obscured by a hood, now sang in a voice as beautiful as it was terrible. Sanctificator nomentum. This was followed by a stumbled attempt at repetition by the cowed congregation. Apart from the youngest children, all the reluctant worshippers knew the words, being the same as those chanted by all Tylians during the most common service to Moor. The entire unholy mass was to be an inversion of the familiar, a profane mockery twisted to serve Nagash. Better! said Biagino, his satisfied smile revealing the crooked fang sitting uncomfortably large in his mouth. Then he addressed the congregation with a short homily. 
It gives me great satisfaction to see you all gathered here today. You are the last of the living in the city, and in what days remain of that life, your prayers will serve as the perfect prelude to your imminent sacrifice. Let your every thought be fearful, and all your pain and suffering be a gift unto glorious Nagash. For soon you will be his entirely, for evermore, and then all your suffering will end and begin. He crooked his finger at his acolyte, who now sang another prayer, pausing between each line to allow the congregation to give their faltering repetition. Libera nos domine, apeste et fame, a morte perpetua. Indeed, you shall never fall sick again, declared Biagino, recommencing his homily, nor feel the pangs of hunger. You will be delivered from all such things. Death itself shall not come to thee, and you will forget all you knew, even the name of the false god more. For you will walk this earth as a servant of great Nagash, wholly beholden to his will through the medium of myself, his true servant. His own words reminded him that there were still creatures in Narotia that he had yet to bend to his will, a mob of ghouls and a large pack of direwolves. And there were, without doubt, Still many more ancient warriors lying there he had yet to summon to swell the ranks of his army. This train of thought was suddenly disturbed by a commotion at the back of the nave. Peering with a new power of sight his old, living body was entirely incapable of, he spied a desperate fool clambering over the pews in a pathetic attempt to flee, only to come face to face with the rank of skeletal guards at the back. Two thrusts of a rusty-tipped spear halted the potential escapee. He looked at the osseous warriors, perhaps considering whether it would be better to die now than to continue his present misery, then turned back to face again towards the altar. Biagino tuttered to show his disapproval, his subsequent sneering glare no more or less ugly than his face at rest. I will brook no such nonsense, he warned. Any foolishness will be punished most severely. There are worse ways to suffer than your present misery. Now... Shall we continue with our prayers? Bigino himself took up the prayers once more. Nagash domine et magister, adveniat regnum tuum domine, fiat voluntas tua. Once again, the response was ingrained in the forced worshippers' minds, despite the unholy insertion of foul Nagash's name in the preceding prayer. Nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. They sang with a tunelessness occasioned by fear. Now, where was I? He asked himself. Ah, yes, the valley. Suddenly he knew exactly what to do. He would array his forces in the valley and meet the foe there, where the ground itself would provide him with reinforcements. He could also wrest magical mastery of the wild inhabitants to make them his to command. The enemy would find themselves facing a foe from their nightmares in a place of their nightmares, and his own army would be even greater than at present. Where better? 